back in the smoke-filled room and with the Illinois primaries next Tuesday, as we're recording this on Thursday, we've got a lot to cover. We are absolutely in politics and we're a little bit in silly season. So there's a lot of craziness happening in Illinois politics right now. And so we want to get right into it. As always, we've got some uh, excellent guests with us and some experts and then some others, but we'll talk about them in a second. But uh, we're really excited to have Mark, Backnick, Mark Batnick with us. The bat is here. Uh, he's the former Illinois House Republican floor leader uh, and widely considered by both sides of the aisle to be an expert on a number of different uh, 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 policy topics. So, Mark, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on. Excited to uh, be on the show. You guys do a great job. Thank you. Uh, I'm also really excited to have Kathy Salby with us. She is uh, has a, an impressive bio, which I'll get into in a second, but also is just one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. So we're really happy to have Kathy here. She's a former Republican nominee for U.S. Senate. Uh, she's a partner at Salvi and Maher. Uh, and she started her legal career working in the second appellate district of Illinois as an assistant public defender up in Lake County. Kathy, glad to have you. Great to be with you. Uh, happy to be a fan of your show and also now to be a participant. So what a great group of folks you've got here. Thank you. Well, that uh, that applies to everybody but our next guest, uh, Patrick Houston, <laughs> who's the founder, editor, and producer of The Illinois. Patrick, we're a little bit happy to have you. Don't lie. It's okay. I can be your party pooper. <laughs> we also have Every core strategies, political experts, Chris and Michael with us, guys. Really glad to have you here as we talk politics. Absolutely. Always a good All time, right. Colin. Let's do it. Let's go right into it. Um, the, if there's one narrative that I'm hearing about the IL-12 race <laughs> between Boston and Bailey, it's that, thank God, it's almost over. <laughs> record this on Thursday. There's just five days left. As you guys watch this, it might be even closer. Uh, it has been, uh, at times, a bit of a nasty primary, but thankfully, it's almost done. Michael, why don't you kick us off? I know there's some big developments. Bost has a, had a closing ad that he's put up that uh, I think a lot of us have agreed was a really good ad and uh, maybe the best one that he's done. Um, we talked last week about if Darren Bailey really believed in himself, he'd put money in the campaign, and he has. He threw 55K of his own money in, so we got to give him kudos for that. So uh, clearly this thing's steaming towards the end. What are you hearing, Michael? Yeah, so Mike's got a kind of closing arguments ad. It's kind of a hybrid of... Um, the Trump endorsement, it kind of leads off with that. And then it kind of goes in to some of the things that he's prioritized as a congressman, you know, working to uh, help our vets, farmers, manufacturing, et cetera. Um, you know, the cons general consensus is it's a really strong ad. I think everybody pretty much agrees with that. And, you know, I live in the district. I, every time I open up YouTube, that's the ad I see. So they're really running it, running it strong um, through the end. Um, I got two more mailers today. Um, kind of highlighting that Trump endorsement and some other and some other things. So they're definitely running through the tape. Um, as you alluded to, uh, Darren, you know, put in another 55K. I thought it was kind of interesting. I heard yesterday that he had pulled about $8,500 from his TV spend. So he, he kind of pulled back on that a little bit. So it's going to be interesting to see what he does with this, you know, $62,000, $63,000 that kind of got added to the coffers in the last five days. I mean, there's not a lot you can do with that much time on the clock. Yeah, I mean, generally the cake is baked by this point, but you know, certainly we'll see. I mean, that ad by Boss was strong. We, we've given him a little grief. Some of the earlier ads were too wordy and weren't as as good as they could have been. Um, but they're closing on their on their best with their best foot forward. I mean, it was Trump, life, guns, farms, done. Like it it hit on the points it needed to hit on and did it without being overly wordy. So it was a good ad. Um, and I know Bailey, their team is out there. I mean, their strength is grassroots and they're definitely, you know, beating the bushes. And um, so this thing's, you know, going to come down to the to the turnout at the end. But I think a lot of us are hearing, we talked about it last week. I'm curious what you guys all think. Seems like Boston is, uh, you know, in the lead on this thing as we come down the final stretch, but curious what everybody's opinions are. I've got a couple. I helped, uh, I helped Matt from M3 pull that race. I'm not, I don't own M3. I don't, I'm not an employee of it, but I do help them with some stuff. Um, and I did, I did actually encourage him to pull in that race. And we pulled uh, right before Haley dropped out. And the most interesting thing about the cross tabs was if you looked at just Trump voters, it was 50, 50, it was tied. Um, yeah. Where boss would put boss over the top by six points was actually the Haley voter. So it's going to be interesting to see who turns out with Haley dropping out. And I also find it interesting that the Trump voters were 50, 50, after Trump endorsed, um, after Trump endorsed boss. So it, it, it definitely lends itself to the strength, the grassroots strength 
that Bailey has on the ground of knowing people that Trump can endorse and still Trump voters are staying with them. I, I would give Boss the edge in this race, uh, but I give Bailey a one in three chance of winning it if he had to, if, if I had to make odds, that's the way I'd lay it out. That, that to me was the most interesting part of that A3 poll was that they were still tied among Trump supporters. Uh, even after the Trump endorsement, even after Bost had been shoving it down the throats of, of voters via mail and TV for weeks now, uh, it's still tied uh, among among those Trump voters. Obviously, the Haley voters are, are not going to turn out, at least on Election Day, as, as one would have expected. You know, there will be some some early and, and mail votes that went in early. Uh, but there's there's reason to believe that this is a toss up. And and if if you're counting on a team to get out of ground game, I mean, Bost has the money, but, you know, Bailey's got a real ground roots group of people or grassroots group of people down down in the southern part of the state that love him. Uh, and and I, I would be a little bit worried if I'm team boss and I don't have this completely locked in at this. Point. I have a. a a comment on that and the uh, race in that I think that both candidates are very attractive for the district and in either event, uh, either candidate will serve the district very well. I really like Mike Bost and the way he has served and I think he deserves another term uh, on account of that. And I was frankly disappointed that Darren put his name into it and called him personally before he even announced saying, Darren, let's fight the Democrats. Let's Despite the leftist Marxist agenda, and I think that uh, even just the the thought that he would be there in the wings, I reminded him will keep uh, Mike Boss face, faithful to his uh, uh, deeply rooted conservatism. But Mike, I when I ran for statewide office, I traveled all over. I I traveled with the Bailey crew, and they're awesome. And I traveled with the Boss crew, and they're awesome. So it was uh, disappointing to me to see the limited resources that we have in Illinois to elect Republicans uh, divide the spoils in that way. So um, uh, it should help, I believe, the Trump endorsement. Mike Boss suits the district, and he was there for president during his tenure. And uh, uh, it'll be, I think, like you said, Patrick, a wait and see. Does I mean, the I was... Trump endorsement, does the Trump endorsement have the same impact that we all thought it really would? I, I mean, clearly, we all thought walking into this, and I know we talked about it the last time I was on this show, that that whoever gets the Trump endorsement wins this race. Is is the Trump factor not as significant as we thought it was? I think okay. you have, you have to look at the boundaries. You know, in the areas where Mike is strong, it's the areas he served. But after the redistricting, he picked up some ad additional territory. And in that area, uh, it's pretty that's the area that uh, it's uh, it, that Bay, uh, Darren is um, native to, if you will. And so he has his strength there. So uh, it'll be it'll definitely be a race to watch. But in either, either event, I think the district will be well served. Yeah. And to, to, to piggyback off what both of you said, the. Uh, both of them had high favorables in the poll, right? So people liked both of them. It wasn't like they were they were really high um, uh, disapproval for for either candidate. As far as the the Trump endorsement, I think it would help Bailey more than the boss. I go back to that Alabama uh, um, Senate race where Trump endorsed someone that lost and said he should have endorsed the other guy and that whole thing. It's hard for a Trump supporter to look at Bailey and not see a mini Trump, right? And I think Bailey is just such a well-known commodity. Trump endorsements aside, I think people that like that brand politics see that from Darren Bailey. So he has a more hardcore, um, more car hardcore type of following. And I think that probably built a little bit of a moat for Darren against the, uh, the fact that Boss got that endorsement. Well, and I also think, you know, there's only been like two like public external polls on this race. The one that we did, you know, at the beginning of this cycle and then the one that Mark was involved in. Um, and there wasn't really much difference between, you know, the numbers there. It was Mike up six, Mike up six. Like, so I think that going into this, there wasn't a lot of room like for movement. Like people were kind of locked in in their two camps. There was, you know, maybe 15, 20% that were like, quote unquote, undecided. Um, and, you know, they both have their base and their base is locked in and you're not really going to peel people off. It's just where do the, what do the undecideds do? 
which it looked like on your poll that the undecideds were kind of leaning towards boss by a little bit. I mean, it's not going to be, nobody's going to run away with the undecideds, but it's leaning in Mike's favor in that sense. Yeah. So the last two weeks, you guys have me second guessing myself because when Boston door, when, when Trump endorsed boss, I sat back in his chair and I said, this race is over. Bailey's toast. He's got no money. He's got no campaign. He's just got a bunch. He's got, he's got the grassroots. But now here we are five days before the election. It's going to be four tomorrow when this comes out. And we're all saying to ourselves, maybe Bailey can still win. And this goes to the question of this was the initial question. Does, does Trump endorsement matter? We all thought that in this district, Trump's endorsement would be solid gold, that it would carry the day. But right now, based on this polling, and maybe it's moving a little bit as boss continuously gets out the message, hey, Trump endorsed me, Trump endorsed me, drill that into the minds of voters. But in reality, it's going to come down to who has the hardest support, who has the softest support. Bailey being the, the grassroots candidate, he's got hard support. People are going to the polls. They love Darren Bailey. Boss support, it's a little softer. We talked about the Nikki Haley supporters, I, you know, who, who I, might not show I, up at I, all. Chris, I hate to disagree with you, but... Please do. Is, <laughs> Austin loved in his district. He works tirelessly. He's an amazing representative. He's almost the model representative. That's why it's a, such a shame that he sees a primary. He's exactly Boston, what you want to see. Boston is loved know. by the establishment. Boston is not, he's not in, in the Trump wing generally. He's always been an establishment guy. It, it's just he, he's loved he was by quick to wrap his arms around the big orange god when, when it was politically expedient for him. I think you're both. Well, you know, the nice thing is, I see him. He goes to the, he's at the pancake. He's at the funerals for the important, the people who've served him. He goes, he supports the local uh, small guy, you know, the county board candidates, the, the state rep candidates. He's there. He's a, uh, he's a real hands on, uh, uh, constituent driven, grassroots driven uh, legislature, but he knows how to, work his agenda through Washington. I mean, you can't have somebody who's a babe in the woods to Washington uh, swampy stuff, but he's not swampy. He's loyal and faithful to his constituents and that's why he's beloved. And that's why I think he's got the edge. So what Bailey well, has, he's got a gubernatorial campaign. Darren Bailey ran statewide, so his name is very strong. So it shouldn't be a surprise that his name idea is very strong in the district as well. So all, all the things that, that Kathy just said are reasons why boss should win this race. You know what I mean? They're not necessarily reasons why he will, because frankly speaking, I come from the, the area where constituent services and going into can cake breakfast and all those things matter. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter in Southern Illinois, but for a congressional primary in the era of Trump, what matters is Trump. And even with Trump's endorsement, we're now seeing that it isn't even necessarily that Trump endorses you. It might be the fact that boss probably still will win this race. I'm not moving away from my prediction. But some, but in this area, it might not be the good constituent services. It might just be they want the bombastic guy who is willing to get himself arrested by the attorney general, perhaps, for disobeying gun laws. And that's a bad t a testament to voters in this day and age. I get that. But the fact that Bailey is even capable of getting over 40% against Mike Boss is, is a testament to the fact that voters don't necessarily only care about those Bread and butter, I showed up to your buddy's funeral. No, it's they care about the, the red meat. I talk about all the time about how the progressives want the real deal. They want the red meat. The conservatives ask, want that too. Rodney Davis. Ask Rodney Davis about constituent services mm -hmm. and how that worked out for him. Yeah. Well, let me say this. Chris, you mentioned that uh, all of us are are waffling on, on our stance. So let me be very clear. I'm not in any way waffling on the fact that boss is going to win by, his, by a good margin in this race. Um, when you guys talk about thinking, does, does Trump... Does his endorsement have less of an impact than we thought? I don't believe that's the case. I think what you're what we're missing is what Michael said, which is there weren't a lot of undecideds when this race began. And so if you just put everybody in their buckets and say these guys and these guys already knew exactly who they're gonna they're gonna vote for. And now amongst this group is Trump having an impact. I think Trump's endorsement has has it had a big impact. And I think frankly, Mark's poll showed that that you see the undecideds breaking enough that they are moving this race by two points uh in favor, almost three points in favor of Mike. 
bust when you're looking at a small subset of undecideds because that subset was tiny. When I went down there at the beginning of this race, everyone that I talked to was already Team Bailey or Team Boss. There were, I, I don't know that I met a single undecided voter. We weren't talking about a big pool of people who were left to be decided. I think Trump's endorsement did have a gigantic impact on a tiny, tiny subset of people. But when it comes to data, um, you know, that's not going to make a huge difference in the numbers, but two or 3% margin in the race is significant. So I still sit at, I think Bailey will overperform any poll. So I think boss is actually up by more like eight or nine right now. I think Bailey overperforms and boss ends up winning by five or six. And it's right about what we've been saying since day one. You know, my prediction at the start of the year was boss would win by more than 10. Uh, okay. I don't think it will be that big. I, I think yep. it will be, I think it will be inside five at this point. Okay. I'll, repeat, I'll repeat what I said last week. If if Bailey gets within four points of, of Mike Boss, his campaign team needs to be tried for political terrorism. <laughs> All right, let's keep moving for time. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple Democratic races. Uh, obviously, our uh, our focus is right of center, but there's some interesting things happening in some Democratic primaries that actually will have a, a possibly a long-term impact on the Democratic Party and on Republicans in general. So we're going to talk about a few races here, uh, partially because they're super interesting and partially because they do have an impact right of center for us. We're going to start in House District 31. A lot of you who watch this are pretty savvy in politics. So you know that Speaker Welsh has been trying to remove one of his own members, Mary Flowers, uh, and he has directed a significant amount of money, nearly $1.5 million, uh, maybe more by the time this, this podcast comes out, into knocking out one of his own members, a former member of leadership, let alone one of his own members. Um, and Patrick, I'll start with you because you've been hearing and you've reported on the Illinois. That there's a growing feeling here um, that he might not succeed, that he might spend all this money to knock out one of his own members, and that member might somehow make it through this thing. What are you hearing? Mary Flowers is a, a real uh, institution in in on the south side of Chicago. She's been in uh, in the house since Colin, you and I were in diapers. Uh, I mean, literally in the the mid eighties when she was when she was elected. She's seventy two. She's been there forever. She's also a pain in the butt for House leadership. Uh, she she has even before finding herself removed from leadership and kicked out of House caucuses for uh, telling a, a House Democratic staffer that they were dressed like a Nazi, uh, that uh, that she caused a lot of headaches uh, for Chris Welch and for his leadership team and you know Speaker Madigan before that, but obviously that's a little less important now. Uh, and, and Mark has seen that personally on the, the House floor, that she's uh, ruffled a few feathers. Uh, this is unprecedented, really, to uh, see a speaker go out and, and direct this amount of money from unions, from his supporters, and from members of his own caucus to try and take her out. Uh, and the, the, the reality is that Michael Crawford is a complete unknown in that district. Um, he he works, you know, at a at a at the Chicago School, which is a, a behavioral sciences university downtown. He's he's not like a a local political figure by any means, and his entire message has been anti Mary Flowers, and and no pro Crawford. So if you have an entire neighborhood or electorate in that area. And, and she added some of like the Southwest suburbs and in, in, as that district got uh, a little gerrymandered and split up in, in 2021, you have a lot of people who either know and like Mary Flowers or know and have a positive view of Mary Flowers mm -hmm. who are now hearing nothing but Mary Flowers bad. And, and they've already made up their mind mm -hmm. and she's knocking doors, she's working hard, she doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, but but she is a fixture in that neighborhood, and and there is a growing sense among House Democrats that she could win on Tuesday. And this, so, you mentioned Mark the the, the Ken Duncan analogy or, or comparison. You know, you mentioned that, and and you know, Mary Flowers is is no Ken Duncan. I mean, she is she's been in that district for so long um, and beloved in that district. It's just like we're talking about in Republican primaries, where good luck knocking out a Blaine Wilhauer or uh, good luck knocking out a, an Adam Niemerg or one of these guys in a, in a Republican primary. It's the same thing for a Mary Flowers. Good luck if you're a Democrat trying to knock her out. I, I don't know how you do it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, let me, the Ken Duncan reference was just to say, well, it's not 
totally unprecedented. It's unusual to take out for the speaker to spend that much money trying to take out a member of his own caucus. Obviously, the Duncan situation was different. I'll just say this, and, and I have no data on this race. Patrick's going to know way more than I know on it. But I'll just say Mary Flowers is to that district what Jesse White was to the Secretary of State office. So we'll see if they're able to pull off knocking out somebody that has that much cachet um, on the ground where they are. Well, from our perspective, I mean, you think about this again, we focus more on a right of center perspective. Uh, you know, if she's a problem for House Democrats, then we don't mind having her there. So, <laughs> you know, her pulling that off is not the worst thing. And then on top of that, you know, this, you know, this is going to cause some consternation in the, in the caucus. I mean, the, the, the speaker going after one of his own members, whether she was liked or disliked, the speaker going after one of his own members and then losing, you know, this this creates a lot of complications in that caucus and for the speaker. Um, and it creates, and I want to throw it to you, Chris, next here, because it's an narrative you've been pushing for a while now that that Welsh is, is pretty ineffective. I mean, if he was not able to take out this member that he spent a million, million and a half to take out, it does continue that chorus of, is this speaker actually an effective speaker go ahead chris so with that i mean i've been saying this whole time welch lost i think five incumbents in the 2022 primaries so he's just getting ahead of it this time around and taking him out his damn self and this isn't even yeah. the first instance of this this cycle they were trying to take out cyril nichols for the longest time until they finally pushed him to dropping out so it wasn't just mary flowers on the chopping block here uh, there's two things i want to talk about they're still mailing that district. There was another report out today that the CFL dropped another mailer for um, for Crawford. If they were confident in their polling or they were confident in anything with this race, they wouldn't still be mailing, and they sure as hell wouldn't have dropped the 23 mailers they are they have already. At this and broadcast. Point, and broadcast. And broadcast. And broadcast. Well, I was gonna broadcast get TV. Three hundred thousand dollars in TV ads for a South Side majority black state representative district this doesn't really happen outside of the ken duncan situation that mark mentioned earlier so duncan, duncan though is I, I think duncan is apples to oranges because he had he had buddied up to bruce rauner i mean that was yeah. a they treated him as a republican and not like an established democrat right yeah, I agree. Agree. yeah I agree. In, 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 in either in either in either instance the fact that they're putting all of this effort and spending this much money tells me that they're probably still underwater in their polling. Or if they're up, it's by like one or two points and are not very confident. The other thing I want to mention is I've looked at the early voting numbers from this district. Um, right now, most of the early voting is coming from the city, as you can imagine. The top early voting location is the 18th Ward, which is significant because the 18th Ward committeeman, Derek Curtis, is backing Crawford instead of Flowers in this race. He's one of two committeemen not to be backing Flowers in this race. But the second committeeman, the second top, uh, ward for turnout to 17th Ward, where David Moore is backing Mary Flowers. He's backing her pretty significantly. He came out last week in the media saying, you know, how upset he was that they're trying to take out Mary Flowers. Mm -hmm. So with all that being said, Welch better pray that the, he actually takes out Mary Flowers. Because if he doesn't, it's a bad, bad precedent that you tried taking out your own member and you still couldn't beat them. Now, mm -hmm. will that matter? Will Wel Welch pick up seats in the general election for Republicans? Probably, but even still, it's bad precedent for Welch to try and take an incumbent with millions and millions of dollars in labor and caucus money and still come up short. Plus, I don't mind seeing I, them waste all these resources. Go ahead, Kathy. You can always expect infighting when you have a supermajority. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, suspect that many of the, her fellow members, of course, they're going to go along. Uh, it, Welch is going against Mary Followers is a signal to his other caucus members. And it just shows you the the fist hold that he has over that caucus. Yeah, it's a, these, it's these interesting. Moves were, yeah, these moves are very much a "don't cross me" signal for 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 him to his membership. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go to a, a sort of a, the other side of the coin here. So in the Senate, you have almost the exact opposite situation where President Harmon is trying to save his own member in Senate District 20. Uh, and so there are four people in that race, but really it's a three person race. Uh, and Natalie Toro is the appointed member and Harmon is coming in trying to save her and, and keep her in. Meanwhile, progressives want their candidate, Gabriella Guzman. And then you've got Dave Nyack, sort of the um, you know, the, 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 I don't know, the, what, what do you call that? The sort of the screw in that, that's, that's stuck in there that screws everything up. Um, but, you know, he's jumping a ton of his own money in this race. And we've been hearing a lot of rumors about polls that have 
Toro, the incumbent, in third out of the three major candidates, which would be a huge mark against President Harmon. Um, I mean, obviously, he's doing his job and he's showing up for his member, but to spend well over a million dollars on behalf of the incumbent and for her to come in not even second, but maybe even third, um, could really weaken him and look really bad for him. Curious who has thoughts on this Senate race. I have lots of thoughts on thoughts mm -hmm. this Senate race. I'm going to actually take the exact opposite track that you, you did. I think it's going to look awesome for uh, Harmon. And the reason is, is this is an appointed senator and he went all in for him. And it's going to be one of the things, you know, when you're an incumbent, we back you. We do everything we can to win. You can't say we shorted you. We did all these mailers. You just weren't good enough for that district to win. I think Guzman wins. I think Guzman wins easy. Nyack kind of came out of nowhere. Whether whether it's two three three two Toro uh, Toro and Nyack, I'm not sure. I'd actually give the just the money spent and the organization and everything else. I think it'll be a distant second to Toro. I think Nyack put up a really good fight, um, but I think Harmon Harmon with his own caucus comes out looking fantastic. He did everything, even though he had the polls that showed that that Guzman was way behind. He was willing to back her to the end and every other incumbent in that caucus is gonna know that if they're challenged in a primary, there's gonna be no stone unturned to try to help you get reelected. So uh, it'll look bad on the win-loss thing. Guzman will come in, she'll be the incumbent. If the tails are, you know, things are switched next time, he'll probably go out and protect her. So I think he's gonna come out in his caucus looking good. And no yeah, it's, I, real quick, Chris, I, I think that's a fair point. I would just say there's a trend here. I mean, you've got Rachel Ventura, you've got you've got a, a growing trend here of yes, thank you, uh, Senate President, for backing me, but also your apparatus keeps losing in Democratic primary. So thank you for the money, but you know there is a bit of a trend line that that's starting to show here of if he loses this race, that's not a great track record in Democratic primaries for his Senate caucus, and it's just something that might build over time. Yeah, but Colin, the Rachel Ventura instance, in this instance, the problem isn't necessarily with the campaign. I can argue about why the campaign for Toro was failing in a second here, but it was because the way that they came into power. Eric Matson versus Ventura, they had John Connor resign for family reasons so he could run for judge full time and give Eric Matson the benefit of incumbency. And that was a huge issue for Rachel Ventura and her supporters because it seemed like they were passing it on and not allowing democracy to take its course. It's the same instance in this race where the Democratic committeemen in Chicago, they choose, you know, Iris Martinez's favorite candidate, Natalie Toro, which doesn't play in that particular district. Nobody could have saved Natalie Toro. Nobody could have saved Eric Matson probably in 2022. These people were dead on arrival and Harmon's doing everything he can to give at least give the optics that, yes, we are supporting you. And even if you're dead on arrival, we will still support you because you're a Senate Democrat. It's worth noting that that the Ventura race was a little different because she had run for uh, Congress in 2018 um, and then County Board in 2020 and then Senate in 2022. So she had started to to build a bit of an infrastructure in that area. The, the but essentially here it was CTU, right, that 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 was the. Uh, the main backer and organizer for Guzman in this race. And and the the reality here is what does it what does it do for Senate Democrats to lose this race? They're they're not losing a vote on the floor. You know, Guzman is going to vote like Toro. Uh, Nyack would vote like Toro or or uh, Zayas. You don't think so? Well, I'm but here's the thing. It's because you've got you, multiple you've situations. Got You've got the Robert Peters and the Cecilia Villanueva, and you've got Rachel Ventura. They're oh, all Guzman is, Guzman is going to be way more progressive than Toro will be down there. And so it's not just the votes and what bills do they push forward. I mean, this drags that, that caucus even further left when Harmon's trying to keep it more mainstream, more moderate. And now we've got yet another situation where a uh, more mainstream Democrat's being replaced by a more progressive but, Democrat. But the, that's just going to drag them even the further power, left. The power has already shifted in that caucus to the left. Robert Peters runs that caucus. Not, not. I mean, it, it's it's a it's a progressive caucus anyway. And Don Harmon's just trying to hold on with bailing wire and duct tape. Well, I would, it, give, I would give Harmon a little bit more credit than holding on with duct tape. 
I mean, I think either way, though, I mean, another progressive member down in Springfield, we see this leftward movement by the Democratic Party. And there's a lot of there's a lot of press that has spent on look at how Republicans are struggling because the party puts up a, you know, a more moderate or mainstream candidate and then the grassroots rejects them. But the same thing is happening on the left here. You see Harmon, they they were part of putting up Toro. It's not like Harmon didn't have some piece in, in Toro becoming the the the, the, or the, uh, the appointed Senate member there. And then yet again, a more progressive candidate comes in. And so this, this does not get enough coverage where for the Democratic Party, when they try to put somebody in who's more mainstream, they're getting knocked out in their primary by more progressive people. This keeps happening to the Democratic Party in Illinois, and you're seeing the results down in Springfield as we talk through, and we'll do it later on this uh, this podcast if we have time, uh, where we talk through some of these crazy uh, actions of these progressive Democrats that are not in lockstep with the people of Illinois. But Colin, this is the most progressive district in the state. You're, you're 100% right. that It's a bad thing for the Democratic Party to move away from more mainstream representatives and more, move to more leftist representatives. 100% accurate. The issue is, is that this was originally Christy Passione Zayas, who's now Brandon Johnson's deputy chief of staff. She was one of the most lib- uh, leftist members of the caucus. So you're not really, yes, you moved a little bit to the right with Toro, but really you're just, nature is just healing here. You were never, ever, ever going to get a moderate Democrat elected in a Logan Square, Avondale-based Senate district. That's just never going to happen. This is the most liberal part of the city of Chicago. It, uh, yes, it, it's bad. I would rather Toro win than Guzman. But I also recognize that that's not what the voters of that district want, and that's not, and that's exactly what they're not going to get. Yeah, fair enough. Let's talk about one more Democratic race, uh, and then we'll get into some uh, some other topics here. So let's talk Cook County State's Attorney. We did cover it pretty extensively last week, but I want to bring it up again just because Burke has brought in yet more several hundred thousands of dollars in that race. Um, and it does seem to be one of the capstone races in this area. And as we talked about last week, Republicans have a a uh, interest in this race because if Clayton Harris pulls off that primary, um, which is looking possibly more and more likely every day, you know he's been, he's a Kim Fox acolyte, and that is going to help Republicans all throughout Cook County, especially judicial candidates. So um, Eileen O'Neill Burke has had all the money and every advantage, and absolutely should win this Democratic primary. But it seems like they're doing everything they can to screw that up. So curious what you guys are hearing is the in our final podcast before election day on that one. With the amount of money that's being spent on O'Neill Burke in the final week of the the campaign as a Cook County resident I, who only watches Illinois basketball games on television, I am so thankful to have YouTube Premium uh, and yeah. not have to deal with any of the those ads and 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 all of the uh, the the crazy stuff that you're 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 seeing pushed out there. If O'Neill Burke doesn't win this race, she has no one to blame but herself. Uh, they they have taken in so much money. You you had a, a clear path with the way that Kim Fox has underperformed in suburban Cook the last two times. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that you know you could have become the suburban candidate, uh, and and turnout's going to be way down in the suburbs. I have not seen a single. Uh, Burke sign out in uh, the near northwest suburbs in in Cook County, out in that O'Hare area, outside of a polling, not a polling place. Uh, the, the, there is no infrastructure out here. Nobody's knocking on doors. Uh, nobody's following up for this race. What are they doing? Where's this money going? And, and it's, it's all going up on TV, and that's it. That's the only place it's going. There's, there's, with that much money, they should have some sort of a ground. How you're not paying walkers to get out into your your wealthier suburbs, you know, your your Highland Parks and your Park Ridges and your, you know, Skokies. What what are you doing? Where are you? Well, at? If, they're, yeah. if they're putting people in Highland Park, that means they're in the wrong county. But I do get your point. You know what they I mean? should I'm be. Sorry. Yeah. I just uh, have to give you some grief. When that guy, I think when that goes where my head was. But there you I, go. I think what we're, we're forgetting about here, though, is how hard it is for for Burke to navigate this race. And I think the mistake she made is she tried to like kind of sort of stay mm-hmm. uh, progressive. This is a Democratic primary. We think that she should romp because Fox was bad and Harris. She would win a nonpartisan election over Harris easily the the mistake that i think she made is she was trying to be cute do you want change and i'm for you know getting when she uses things like root causes 
of crime, that's a Brandon Johnson sort of phrase. So that doesn't get somebody who's a moderate or maybe even a Republican who has nothing to vote for, doesn't give them a reason to really come out and vote for vote for Burke. And 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 so it's it's a tough lane for her to navigate to be to the right of Kim Fox and and Harris, but good enough for, for a Democratic primary, even with that money. The other thing that is, I think, an under um, something that hasn't been talked about very much, we talked about because we did pull this race and it was amazing the amount of undecideds in this race, is that the hot races, for the most part, are in progressive areas. And in a low turnout race, those hot areas like the 20th, which is going to have more turnout than, say, some Senate district that doesn't have a, a race going on, is going to disproportionately affect these countywide races. And just the city having races in, in general is going to affect more than the county not having any races. So I think what you're going to get is an uneven turnout. That uneven turnout helps Harris. You throw the CTU in, that helps Harris. You throw the fact that he's playing the money against Burke in a Democratic primary. She's not being strategic and kind of under the ground on it. It's not the type of campaign that I would have suggested running, but it is a little bit of, of a tough path for her to navigate considering who her electorate is. We had a tie with like 58% undecided. I give a slight edge to Harris just simply based on those intangibles that are hard to quantify. Well, he's he's going to overperform the polls based on the factors you mentioned and just based on the Democratic Party's endorsement. There's a lot of those Democratic voters who are going to go to the polls with those those cards that have who to vote for. And they don't they're not going to know who to answer in a poll, um, but they're going to know it because they're going to walk in with that sheet that tells them who to vote for. So Harris will overperform any polling, probably by a decent margin. So if, if it is indeed tied, um, then Harris is going to win by, uh, I, I'd say, a decent margin at this point. Uh, Burke should be up in the polls going into a election day or she's toast you know after the mayoral election i had some choice words to say about the paul vallis for mayor campaign they were warranted some people still haven't gotten paid of course um but in any case i will be rendering apologies to the vallis for mayor team on election night if and when burke loses this thing because they will have usurped paul vallis for mayor for the most frustrating campaign i have ever seen in my entire life um no awareness Terrible persuasion. It's like 12. <laughs> no, no, get out the vote. No ground infrastructure. Just, I'm pro-choice. I'm Eileen O'Neill Verk. I approve this message. What a well, joke. The, the thing what is, is, I mean, so Mark's right. It is running as the candidate who's not the furthest left candidate in a Democratic primary is a challenge. Where they failed is in trying to run a one-size-fits-all approach in one of the biggest counties in the country. It Maybe it's maybe you have to do that in a small community where you can't have two messages because everyone's going to hear both messages. But in a county this massive, there is no reason to not be running a very targeted race where one message could be going into those black wards, into those minority communities where you have a specific message on crime and maybe that's where you use some of that brandon johnson language and then to the suburbs to patrick's point you have a completely different narrative because their viewpoint on the world is very different than what you might see in the south side of chicago but, to but not be get, running get, a very targeted race in a county this large where you have to run a targeted race that's that's the foundational failure here but get guns off the street and don't put kids in jail for having pot is not a wild message for a person to win in a Democratic primary. She hasn't gone that far. I, I still don't know what she stands for. And, uh, yeah, evident evident evidently only abortion rights, because that's all she puts out there. But Colin's 100% right, because this is something that Paul Vallis actually did right, because I saw Pat Vallis was sending mail targeted to Hispanic areas, the Hispanic population, Hispanic areas, he was targeting white uh, demographics in white areas, and he was trying to target the black demographic in his own stupid way in the black demographic. I, I saw him do that. Burke has not done any of that. She could have mailed the abortion messaging to Northfield, New Trier, and the 49th Ward, and then given my area and probably a little bit of Patrick's area as well, some very tough on crime messaging, and it would have actually worked. Instead, she did none of this. And has now got a lot of voters out there who have no idea there's even a state's attorney's race worth caring about this year and have no idea who to vote for going into the polls. Kathy, you were trying to jump in. What were you trying to say? I just, uh, I, I would agree with much of what you're saying, but I think that uh, I'm not a voter. I will not vote in Cook County, but I think that what voters always, the edge will be given to this person who's most authentic, where their message, you walk away from them and say, well, you know, 
might not agree with them on this and that, but boy, do they have the passion to serve and they have the resume too. And I don't think there she's uh, sold herself uh, enough for those undecided voters, which is why you've got those big undecided numbers. And I watched the two debate and I was not, I didn't, I was, it didn't grab me. I didn't like say, oh, Gotta, we've got to go. So when you're not on Sunday morning, when people are deciding who to vote for, who who already haven't, uh, she will not be the topic at the at the breakfast table, unfortunately. Yeah, you're right. Oh, so there's a, there's a better authentic the, feel. You're right. I found the other person who watched the debate. <laughs> Uh, I was the only person. Now we have two. <laughs> I want to know. No, but uh, to that point, though, I just always look for: is this uh, person running for this office, whatever this office is? Do I believe them? Do they have heart? Are they passionate about serving? Do they make their case? And that 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 was missing. But I'm not going to say that Harris did it better. But with all of those uh, bonuses that he has, the endorsement, the um, you know, you know, count it, uh, the CTU, uh, I'd give him the edge as well. Yeah, listen, I, we sometimes forget, and I think you're right, Kathy, we forget that voters vote based on how they feel. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't make them like you, that's a that's a big impediment. And I don't think that the, the campaign, either campaign has done that well, which then again means uh, uh, that plays in the favor of the candidate who has the more institutional support, which is Harris. All right, let's close down our campaign topic with just a, a free for all. Anybody want to make any final predictions with the primary on Tuesday, just a couple days away from when we're recording this? Any final predictions, ideally more on the Republican side, since that's more of our focus, but any final thoughts, final predictions on a race that you're watching? Go ahead and jump it out. This is your chance. I think I'll go first. Um, I think it's hard to take out incumbent and out of those all those down states, true incumbents, not appointed incumbents, but True incumbents, whether you're talking, whether you're talking Severin, whether you're talking um, Will Hour or Halbrook, I think those all win. Uh, I think one of the most interesting races, though, is Niemer. Uh, I'll let the cat out of the bag. What my strategy would have been if I was running against Niemer, uh, because it's a write-in race, I would have done a huge push towards Democrats who have nothing to vote for through the teachers' union and had them do a big vote by mail push to, to vote in Acklin if that, you know, the teachers union is the one coming after them. I looked, had somebody pull the numbers this morning. There's been no big ballot request hmm. that is different in that district than any other surrounding districts. A little bit, but there's a race there, right? I mean, we're talking uh, 100 or 200 voters. Now, that's not to say they didn't try, um, but if I had to try to win that race and beat Niemer, I would have been big, big, big on a vote by mail. So I'm a little surprised they didn't, uh, weren't able to be a little bit more successful with that. So it'll be interesting to see that race isn't going to be decided on election night. I bet it might get decided in the courts with spelling of the names. Um, so and Jasper uh, County, what's which, that? Which, and Jasper County, which, uh, Ackland did not file in Jasper right. County ahead of time. Yeah. If it comes down to a couple of names here and there, I if if I'm if I'm IEA, I've absolute I absolutely go to court in Jasper County saying intent matters. He was he was filed everywhere. These people want him get a court to 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 get it in, and you're drawing this out even even longer. Uh, the Nieberg race is so wild, uh, and and and. You know, for for your listeners, viewers who don't know, uh, I worked Jim Acklin's race for the House in 2016. Uh, I know him. I love him. I I, I, I clear when I say that. Um, he has he would he 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 makes a lot of sense for that district in a in a lot of issues. Uh, the the only one that that maybe he does he doesn't fit in is the school choice. Uh, question because he feels like it's not necessary downstate. Whether or not you agree with him uh, is is neither here nor there. I I think we're seeing that IEA just doesn't know how to work Republican primaries, uh, and maybe that's who they're contracting with. Uh, whether it's in their their ads or their mail or their strategy, uh, the, the the messages aren't working, and 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 I don't understand why if in a in a district where Nemerg is going to have low name ID, uh, especially in the northern half of that district. Why are you attacking him? You don't mention his name. You know, you you that's the time where you don't mention his name. Uh, because all you want is a focus on Ackland so that you can convince people to write that name down. The, they're they're running a conventional campaign. Uh, 
in in that race like it's two names on a ballot and you're headed mm -hmm. into the final weeks and, and and i just don't think that they i i don't think i don't understand iea strategy at all in that race or well, Patrick, let, me, let me let me for once back you up in that um you know we've run writing campaigns i've done a bunch of them in my career and we've talked on this podcast about how different they are it completely changes the strategy based on what you do be that one little factor changes everything and i'm actually i don't even know how this is possible we've won every write-in campaign we're six for six in write-in campaigns but they're totally totally different so to your point the strategy has been very cookie cutter but it's also it's not just that it's also as you said you know knowing how to speak to republican primary voters it's not a forte of iea nor is it a forte of the people they've hired in a lot of these races they're just it's been very sort of what it, what are we used to saying and let's try to make it sound a little conservative but to the people in those districts it sounds like you can tell when somebody's not being authentic you can tell when somebody's trying to sound like you. When Ronner would drop his G's, it didn't come off as authentic because people knew you're just trying to wear flannel and look like us. Like that's what these campaigns are coming off as. They're not coming off as authentic. They're coming off as some outsider trying to sound like us. And so as a result, it's just voters, to Kathy's point, they want to like you. They want to know that you're authentic. And that's not how these races are coming across. So there's a lot of errors in these races. And I don't see a single incumbent who's going to co who's going to go down uh, in those races. And, and you, well, and, I, can, and you I, and I worked to Southern, Colin and I worked to Southern Illinois based race together in 2020. And, and the way voters talked in that primary was unlike any Republican race I had ever dealt with, either as a reporter or an operative uh, before that. It, it, it used to be guns and taxes and abortion, and it became everything else related to Trumpism. Uh, in in that congressional race that we worked, the, the the norm is out the window with Republican primary politics, especially once you get south of I eighty. You know, I've I've spent some time over the last couple of weeks in in a couple of open Senate districts, and they're not talking like Republicans did ten and twelve years ago. It's a different world, and and the IEA campaigns here have not followed that norm. Yeah, uh, I mean, let me. I I I, think, I just think it's hard. I think there's a big difference between what they're doing in the Will Our Hall race versus the, the Niemery Ackland race. I would have been under the radar in the Ackland race, kind of like what, what you guys are saying. I just think it's tough when you, it's really not a big number of people. And Blaine's been around and people know him and people can talk to each other. And and when you, you just you say, she, I mean, you're talking about an area where where Darren Bailey got 85 percent of the vote. The urban message didn't puncture through down there. It's kind of the same same thing you're trying to do down there. I just, I think it's a tough climb for them. I don't know what you could do to, to make it easier. And who, who knows, maybe, maybe they pull it off in, in the, uh, uh, in, in the hall will hour race. It's just fascinating for me to see what this write-in race is going to end up being. It's just, I, I just have, I have no idea. On it. It's just, I'm just saying it's not the approach I would have taken. That's all. Would it not be a <laughs> on the Acklin one, like early on, they had a really good ad that was like, don't, you know, there's no candidate. D don't let Democrats steal this race. Make sure you write in Jim Acklin. They should have just hammered that all the kind of messaging all the way through, as opposed to pivoting to this where they're like attacking Adam and Adam's attacking right. him because so, all and, they're doing and, is driving each be, other's name idea. Anti-Chicago, anti-Democrats, anti-progressivism like that. There was a lane there and they kind of started there and then, and they got a lot of accolades for it, so they got cocky, and then they just sort of veered off of it. So, um, all right, other races. Anyone have any other predictions or thoughts in any other races before we close this out? Kathy, go ahead. A, a shout out to Steve Balish in um, Homer Township, Will County. You know, he is at the head of this whole uh, battle with the 143rd Street expansion. And I know this morning he did a big push to get as many folks in the audience as possible to be face front, eyeball to eyeball with the county executive there who's uh, uh, done a little double dealing. And I don't know the outcome of that. I tried to call him before today's meeting, but I just think that his representation of his district in all of Will County is the type of citizen leadership that all of us appreciate it. So I just wanted to give a shout out to him. And one last thing, and this is what I was going to mention before, Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I love healthy debate. And I get it every day in a text or a phone message or Kathy, I thought you'd do this or why weren't you more like this? Or why weren't you less like this or whatever? I'm like, well, thank you. For me know. I had no idea there was an issue with this. But the beautiful thing about this is I implore everybody Listen, we're fighting a Marxist leftist agenda. There's no question. The Democrat Party is not even 
nobody, you don't even blush to think that it's what it should be. And it doesn't reflect our dear red state of Illinois. I say red because the good people I met statewide, they, 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 they agree with everything that center right proposes. So here's my challenge to people. Find the 1% you have in common with anybody and talk that issue over and over with them, win them over to vote for the candidates who represent the good and the true and the beautiful. And I happen to, to believe this is the way we will win elections on the Republican side in the state of Illinois. I have great hope for that. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Who else has thoughts on the, the primaries before we get into a few other political topics? So there I, mean, I think the other two that are like super interesting, obviously, are the Severin one and the Bryant one. And I think both of those guys will come out on top, you know, despite how nasty and absurd those have been. Yeah. And there's going to be some hurt feelings over that Severin race. That's for sure. Yeah. And you've got 15, up, you've got 15 House Democratic primaries. You know, everybody's watching the 31st, the 36th, which is the open seat for Kelly Burke, uh, where you've got a really far left uh, candidate in Sonia Khalil and the more middle of the road Kelly Burke style Democrat in Rick Ryan. Uh, that one's going to be interesting to watch. The 76th, uh, which is the open seat that Lancey Ednock is leaving, uh, is um, is is. I think going to be really interesting. You've got a moderate mayor of DeKalb running against a progressive mm -hmm. alderwoman in DeKalb. Uh, they're fighting for 40% of the vote in DeKalb. The other 60% is in LaSalle County, where Yednock is from. And Amy Murray Briel, who is one of his political people, uh, is, is kind of almost uncontested in, in that half of the district. And I don't know that any, either of those uh, DeKalb candidates are making many inroads uh, in LaSalle County. So I'm really interested in seeing how that one turns out. And yeah, I mean, we've talked about the the House races. I mean, there's the 88th with Regan Deering. She's mm -hmm. probably going to win, but uh, it doesn't sound like she's as strong as she would want to be in Bloomington Normal, uh, which is the the larger part of that district. I think uh, I think my friend Chris Balcoma beats Patrick's friend Jesse Faber. <laughs> so that's that, and I think I think I think Regan wins pretty easily overall. But guess is that that one's a guess. Kind of uh, piggybacking off Patrick here, talking about Democratic primaries. Uh, one, I believe that at least one House incumbent Democrat will lose re-election that's not named Mary Flowers. Um, there's a lot there's, of people that believe that. A lot of people on the Democratic side believe that. Yeah. Uh, there is some interesting house races, like in the 21st district with Abul Nasser Rashid. Talk about a terrible ballot name. It's a very it's majority Hispanic district. Who knows what's happened to that district? Um, you know, you got Matt Hansen over in uh, I don't even yeah. remember what number that is, but you know, Mr. DUI man. Yeah, where where Republicans don't have a candidate. So if Hansen does come through, yeah, we can slate somebody. But that's actually barely a Democratic district, and Hansen is weak. It's a huge miss for Republicans if uh, if Hansen comes through that primary. Well, I think at least one House Democrat's going to get the boot this primary cycle. Well, the biggest loser uh, in this whole thing is the voters. Uh, and we didn't get a chance to talk about this last week, but 2024 has the fewest contested primaries in over 20 years. We covered that at the beginning of filing season, um, and it still remains true. The number now this election compared to previous presidential elections is significantly less than we typically see, 30% less roughly than it was four years ago. 88% um, of these races have no candidates or just one candidate. Uh, this is, we need more candidates running. We need more choices for voters. And uh, we all failed in that regards in 2024. So uh, let's shift over with what limited time we have left to a few political topics. We got to start on one that uh, uh, all of us have at least seen in the news. Uh, it's gone back and forth. Now it looks like the Chicago Bears are officially looking to stay in Chicago, um, but now they're going to be looking to uh, have a big fight, it looks like, with the Friends of the Parks, because they're already talking about opposing this thing. But the Bears are talking about putting $2 billion into a new stadium on the lakefront. Uh, I'll just open it up to a free-for-all. My focus on this, personally, is my frustration with these suburban school districts who just cost all of us taxpayers in this area a huge opportunity um, because now it's just going to be condos. It's just going to be you know some development, which fine, but I don't understand what was the impetus for these school districts to fight this to this level because if it's condos, if it's houses, you're bringing in more kids and, yes, more money, but also kids and money. If it's you should, the you should, also have a, you should also have a beef with the Cook County Assessor. I'll, 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 <laughs> I will if you let me get to 
the end of my sentence. So um, the other part of this is if you if the Bears come out and build an entertainment district, you've got no more kids, but still lots more money. I, I don't understand the impetus for these school districts and the motivation to kill this deal, which they are at the heart of killing this deal. And then, yes, Patrick's right. The Cook County assessor did no favors for this whole thing. But this was um, everyone I talked to, including people who are on the inside of this. Uh, it was this was not a fake. This was not a fake to the suburbs. This was steaming towards happening until basically three school districts and the Cook County assessor killed it. And now all the taxpayers in this region are going to pay the bill because if, if, if the bears had come up here, the, the assessments wouldn't have changed, which means you've got all that new tax revenue coming in and all the taxpayers here would have saved money on their property taxes. This would have been great for the taxpayers. It would have raised property tax values. There's not enough being said about how Northwest suburban taxpayers were screwed by this. And I'm one of those, so I'm frustrated. Anyways, that's my beef. Y'all go ahead and talk about what you want to talk about on this topic. Well, the ground is certainly softening legislatively uh, to get something done. Uh, where you're going to raise a tax uh, to pay for new bonds, I think, is going to, to be interesting because Hotel Motel probably doesn't want an additional uh, uh, tax that was that was the impetus of the, the first Bears renovation that the state still owes $600 million on uh, 20 years after it was completed. Uh, so finding a funding mechanism for bonds will be difficult. Uh, the governor has still not seemed excited about this idea. Uh, and, and he's going to have a lot of sway because, remember, he's got those ambitions nationally. Uh, and, and furthermore, the Bears are, are saying that they're in for $2 billion. What kind of money is that $2 billion? Is it is it a loan from the NFL? Is it... You know, is it a promise of something else? Is it their own bonding? Because they're not the the Hallis family, the McCaskey family isn't rich. This is their business, you know, which is why I always thought Arlington Heights was a pipe dream, because they didn't have five billion dollars like Stan Crocky to pop down to pop down on a uh, on an entertainment district. So uh, I, I think that the idea, and that's not even mentioning the Friends of the Parks issue, which is going to wind up in court and will probably delay this for years if we even get there. Uh, just on the legislative side, the, the ground is softer than it has been, but it is not a done deal. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else I, have thoughts? I, Go ahead, Mark. The quick, quick thought. I mean, I think the deal, the deal that can be made from the from the tax revenue standpoint, there's my understanding going back to the beginning is what the Bears really wanted was just kind of an, an internal tax credit, meaning they wanted a cut of the tax revenue that Colin was so excited about going back that that would be the public funding would in one way, shape, or form come that way. I think when you look at deals like this, whether it be a Bears Stadium, whether it be the Intermodal in Joliet or any of those sorts of things, that's kind of the easiest way for the politicians to piece together a deal, right? Because they're not raising taxes on anybody else. They're just giving some of the tax money back to the entity that wouldn't have been there if they, you know, right. if, if the deal didn't get done. So I think you're right in terms of the deal softening. I think that's the way that it gets done. We can, I can talk tax policy and property tax credits and school districts and all that stuff till the sun doesn't shine. But it ain't worth it on this show. <laughs> well, at least I was reading that at least the Bears are putting in, at least committing to cook, kick in $2 billion, whereas Jerry Reinsdorf and our beloved White Sox are basically saying, ha, good luck. Yeah, we want yeah. your money. You're not getting our money. Which no, is no, notice, notice the White Sox are not on the agenda because I'm just, I'm done with them. <laughs> well, and I think that shows you the difference in the approach of the Bears versus the White Sox is – uh, the Bears retooled their message, retooled their effort, hired a new lobbyist who's very close to J.B. Pritzker uh, and, and Lisa Duarte. And, and the White Sox thought, well, we'll just send Jerry Reinsdorf down to Springfield and that'll do the trick. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it, it's it's it shows how uh, the Bears have already uh, improved their standing just by re rejiggering their plan. Yeah. Well, listen, it's, it's, we always say it, it's not necessarily what you do, it's how you do it. And uh, having the right people in the room uh, is certainly a big part of that. All right, let's shift to another political topic. So last week we covered the fact that the Chicago public schools 
uh, continue their their leftward tilt thanks to CTU and how they voted to remove police from schools. Well, there is significant pushback from Springfield Democrats. Uh, as we reported last week, there were a lot of Chicago Democrats who were not happy with Chicago public schools for this vote. Um, and it's not just them. It's Springfield Democrats as well. They recognize that this was way too far left even for them, which again uh, is pretty groundbreaking if you could be too far left for Springfield Democrats. But um, they are now pushing back. They're filing bills uh, aiming to reverse both of these. So removing police from schools and closing selective admission schools like charter schools. Um, those are two things that CTU and CPS are steaming towards that Springfield Democrats are, are actually fighting back on. And so I just, uh, this seems fascinating to me that you've got this fight between Chicago schools and Springfield Democrats. So I figured I'd open that up as a potential topic if anybody else finds that as interesting as I do. I think you're just going to have to see the legislature start to negate some of the 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 really out of bounds stuff that's going to come from the city council over the next few years. I mean, it's going to be Harmon and Welch and Pritzker are going to have to almost be the the bumpers that the kids use in the the bowling alleys because <laughs> it's, I mean that's what the city council is doing is just bouncing back and forth at this point and 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 it's it's going to require the grown ups and and and. You know, whether you agree or disagree with their politics, Harmon and Pritzker, uh, at, at the minimum, are at least the grownups. Yeah, no, and Pritzker has been walking sideways away from Brandon Johnson the entire time Johnson's mayor. So this isn't anything new. It's smart politically for Pritzker to push back in any policy that comes out of Chicago, because if he does have presidential ambitions come convention time, he needs to move away from, you know, Brandon Johnson is my mayor, and he basically needs to say, no, this guy's a freaking idiot. I don't like this guy, and I'm trying to reverse everything this guy's doing. It's good for him politically. It makes him look good. And plus, it's good for the city of Chicago because we actually have some accountability um, for the mayor and for the city council coming from Springfield. Um, I think it's a good thing. And, you know, there's some there's some good Democratic representatives down in Springfield. They'll do this stuff. Whether or not it's going to pass, completely different question. Um, especially if, you know, Tora loses and Guzman gets in there, like Colin was mentioned earlier, that's a seat. That's another vote for the seat to you, but, um, we'll see. I, I think it's a good thing. And I'm glad to see that the Democrats are walking away from Johnson, which isn't hard, but. Well, it's to me, it's again, you, you look at these policies, um, so much focus is on the Republican side on, you know, some of our more conservative policies and members, but you just spend more than 13 seconds looking at, you know, Democrats and some of these policies that they've been pushing forward late, lately. Um, there is no greater indication of how far left this party has gone, even in this state of Illinois, where it's a moderate state, it's a working class state. And you just saw the uproar when Chicago Public Schools said we're going to remove police officers or, you know, school resource officers from our schools. You saw a lot of Chicago Democrats even flip out over that. And that's how far left these policies are. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, so we've covered, not for a while, we covered uh, a bill that was, um, I don't know, not snuck through, but kind of pushed through with not a lot of fanfare uh, that essentially said that to judges around the state, if you want to rule the constitutionality of any bills that come out of Springfield, you can't. Only judges in Sangamon County and in Cook County are allowed to do so. Um, and obviously, there's two sides to this. There's the one side where you try to pretend like this is good policy and say, well, here's the reasons for it. But the reality of this is why Democrats did this is they don't want the Republican judges in the other 100 counties having any sort of a say on what bills are allowed to become law. Now, yes, was that taken advantage of by certain former attorney general candidates? Absolutely. Um, but that's an excuse, not really the actual good policy reason. And so a lot of us were up in arms over this. A lot of my judge friends in other counties were very frustrated by this, that basically they uh, a significant part of their job description was yanked away. Well, just in this past week, uh, a judge in Madison County, I believe it was, uh, ruled that that law is unconstitutional. That is just the beginning of this process. I'm sure it's going to make its way up the courts. I'm sure the Supreme Court's going to ultimately decide, the Illinois Supreme Court's going to ultimately decide on this. Uh, but I do like that it's actually getting in the news because this was a very partisan action taken by Democrats in Springfield that wasn't really treated as such or covered. Uh, and so if you just want to focus on good policy, a judge should be allowed to rule whether they're in one county or the other. Let them do their job. So from good politics and good policy, uh, I'm glad to see that this law is getting a second look. So who else has thoughts? I, I, I have huge thoughts. Look, the Democrats are masters at this. They'll, they'll, they'll say they're doing something for the good of the order, 
and it's for the good of them politically. So I look at, I wrote an article that's in National Review um, about how they gained the vote by mail thing. When they originally passed uh, same day voter registration, vote by mail, you know, all those kind of laws, they did it in ways that specifically helped Democrats. And that's what they're, that's what they're doing with this. For example, on, um, on automatically re getting registered to vote. So if you're on welfare unemployment, you're automatically registered to vote. If you get your FOID card and they do a background check on you and they know exactly where you live, you're not automatically registered to vote, right? When they did automatic vote by mail during the pandemic, they did the 2018 election for people that voted in 2018, which was a wave Democratic year as opposed to a 2016 election when both parties came out and drove. They passed these little things here and here when, when these are the sorts of things that Republicans actually would be better complaining about than these nebulous things that they often do. Because this is gaming the system. And the Democrats in Illinois are very good at gaming gaming the system and passing legislation. I remember when they changed the law so a guy that was a sheriff could run in a different county and he didn't live in that county long enough. So they just changed the law and said, you didn't need to live in that county for a certain amount of time right. to run for sheriff. Or listen, so, or when, when, when Republicans succeeded at knocking off a, a Supreme Court justice, they suddenly said, oh, wait, let's just redraw the boundaries then. I mean, yeah. to your point. Yeah, and exactly. that was good policy. You know, yeah, they, they so. spun it, and no, no Chicago media called them out on it. They were allowed to just run on that narrative of, "Oh, this is for the good of the people." Yeah, no, it, 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 it's it's a shame. And I remember, I believe that might have been passed when I was still down there. Um, and I, whether it was or it wasn't, I just that's just it's it's bad policy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be the guy that puts some salt in your coffee on this one. Uh, the the complaint that that your side is is coming with on this is oh you just don't want Republican judges from around the state to to rule on constitutionality every single elected circuit judge in Sangamon County is a Republican uh, Raylene Grinshaw who who ruled on the COVID stuff Republican the they this this is a this is a solely an issue on standing. You know, you, you can't sue somebody for something that happened, you know, and I'm not the lawyer here. I'll, I'll defer so, to Patrick, Kathy. hold on. Let me let, let me let me do this then. If what you're saying is true, then why Cook County? Why Cook and Sangamon County? The only standing well, is Sangamon County. Well, it's County. very clear that the seat of government is Cook County at this point. I but mean, it's not officially. So if what you're saying is true, then it should be only in Sangamon County. If you're if you if you believe there's no politics here, then you should be standing on the line of only Sangamon, no other county. I, I don't care enough to 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 get all fired up about it like you are, but but to to say that this is only about Republican judges is 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 silly. Just because I I couldn't even tell you the last time Sangamon County elected a Democrat circuit judge. And, and I and I hear your point, and I agree with you. But it's about excluding the other hundred counties that are mostly Republican in their judiciaries. If what you were saying was true, and this truly was good government, then there would not have lumped Cook County in because that's where all their Democrat judges come from. If you if you wanted the goofball who didn't like COVID restrictions because he couldn't go fishing uh, to to rule on the constitutionality of law, then go for it. I, I think that there's a there's a point for for where government issues should be handled and and the the fourth and that's appellate Sangamon and the county. first appellate i i, I that's I, I Sangamon county and well, every Sangamon judge county. in the state was elected just the same and they all haven't uh, taken oath to uphold the constitution and i mean it's just every judge should be able to hear these cases so and that's where i'm at either every judge or only Sangamon county those are the only things you can tell me logically are consistent with logic and the law. But by saying Cook and Sangamon, you're now it's clear you're playing politics because living in Cook County and electing judges in Cook County, I can tell you how these judges are elected in Cook County. They ain't picked because of uh, their 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 prowess on constitutional law. They're picked because they're buddies with some ward boss or because they're next in line or because they made the right number of donations to the right people. So the people you're saying should be allowed to rule on the constitutionality of our laws are 100% controlled by the Democratic Party of Cook County. That's why they allowed Cook County to be one of the two places that can determine the constitutionality of laws. All right, Colin, to, that's how people it. are elected judge everywhere in every county in the state. You know, then you should every, include every county in the state to allow them all to rule the I, constitutionality. I had to file a lawsuit in federal court last year on a First Amendment issue. And and where we filed it had everything to do with venue, you know, with with standing. And, and that was the central district, not the northern district, not the southern district, not 
the the southern district of Nevada. It was it was simply because the central district of Illinois is where the seat of government was, and that's where it had standing. I I just is Cook County in that central seat of that central district. I listen. I I'm not arguing with you on that point. My but you can absolutely make the point that that Chicago is the seat of government more than Springfield at this point. So there are more state employees that live in Cook County than there are in in in. In Springfield. But where the state employees are has nothing to do with where the laws are made. That's where the so, policy is being done. That's where the rules are being drawn. And anyways, uh, I, I think you're, you're doing mental gymnastics to try to make sure you're being balanced here. And I appreciate that and respect that. But either it's the whole state or it's only seven. My, my, my point is, is that that I, I just don't think it's as big a deal as you guys are making it out to be. Uh, it, and and I, it actually, and I think, actually honestly, it is. So, Michael, jump and in I here, think that that there's a the flaw, number of events And I think that, that have, there's a flaw in your logic. The number of events that I've gone to, the number of judges I've talked to outside of Cook County and Sangamon County who are very unhappy about this, that they were elected just like these other judges and they're not allowed to do this portion of their job. It actually is a big deal in the legal community. I've elected some judges downstate none have ever talked to me about. Fair enough. All right. Well, that was a good discussion. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know what? And we've got a lawyer here. Kathy, I'm curious. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, if a piece of legislation affects a business in Jasper County and one of the uh, business owners or individuals who are, is a resident of Jasper County brings a lawsuit locally, they have standing in their county, it might be removed to federal court if it, uh, you know, in some in some in instances, but I would, I, I, if this is a blanket, every single law that's being questioned in its uh, constitutionality has to only be brought uh, in Sangamon or, or, or um, uh, Cook County, Cook. I think that you have to look at what, examine the legislative uh, rationale for that. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing, I didn't know about this until you just mentioned it here. I'd like to read the legislative history on that. And I would agree that it's troubling. Well, that's, well we, I think that's my, my biggest point is that, that I don't think enough people know about this. Insiders like us, nerds like us know about this, but in reality, this has not gotten enough coverage and it it is a big deal. And so I'd like to see the debate happen, at least some eyeballs on this. And people like Kathy should be aware of this as lawyers and, and people in, 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 in who are influencers in the state, but it was pretty much snuck through in Springfield. There were very few people who paid attention when this went through and that's why nobody knows about it. So at the very least, at least now we're going to start to hear about it more. Right. Thank you. Well, and we already kind of have a little bit of a safe, like a quote unquote safeguard on this from the liberal perspective, because if something is like if you bring up unconstitutionality in a circuit court and they rule against, you know, the attorney general in favor of like a small business owner or whatever the case may be, and they appeal that it automatically goes to the Illinois Supreme Court. It leapfrogs over the appellate where so it's like. Just let people have their case heard locally, and then if you don't like the result, then appeal it. That's the process. We don't need to send it to send it to Chicago. All right, let's keep moving. Appreciate everybody's thoughts, and uh, it was good. I love that. Great back and forth. Um, we're speeding towards the end here, uh, but let's talk about this. So um, I want to give kudos to uh, Senator John Curran, the Republican leader. Uh, and the Senate Republicans um, who are going after Pritzker hard on the migrant crisis. And their phrase has been that he created, that's the quotes, because they're using those words. Um, and I, I'll give them kudos. They're doing a, a good job at this. And you know they're doing a good job when you see a, a um, breathless response from the governor's office. So uh, Curran came out this week and they did a press conference this past week. Actually, it was last week, but in the past week since our last episode, um, pushing a bill that requires a report to the General Assembly identifying all state spending on services and resources for migrants. On its face, that seems like pretty good common sense. Like the people who vote on the budget should have some idea how much state money, how much tax dollars is being spent on the migrant crisis. So um, could definitely fits under the the um, you know the header of good government and reporting and transparency. Uh, but of course, there's politics to it. And, and Pritzker's office just came back. I, we don't have enough time for me to read this whole quote, but I'll pull out some stuff. You know, following Donald Trump's orders, sent Republicans are blowing their racist dog whistle um, and conflating immigrant populations to vilify human beings for their political gain. It goes on and on and on. But it is when you know you know you've struck a nerve when it is just that over the top in a response. Uh, so I give kudos to the 
Senate Republicans, they keep pushing on this. This is going to be a good issue for Republicans in November, so they're doing the right thing. Uh, and I think Pritzker hitting back this hard makes them look bad. Uh, I'm sure, you know, Patrick will disagree, but uh, for the rest of you, curious what you guys think. I'm kidding, Patrick. <laughs> No. Uh, immigration in our polls, immigration and, and polls that I've seen other people uh, talk about and do immigration was the number one issue, even above inflation. So that's both a Republican primary poll, polls and general election polls. So it's it it doesn't poll well for the Democrats. I mean, if 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 there was a more mainstream nominee at the top of the Republic, Republican ticket, I think we you'd be looking at a pretty good blow off for them um, across the country. Isn't it, isn't that frustrating, Mark? That we we are one factor, one tiny factor away from this being a massive wave for Republicans because the migrant crisis. I, I have a lot of Democrats and independent friends who um, they, that's the one thing they're honked off about uh, for the left is the migrant crisis. Yeah, well, for sure. Yeah, totally agree. Well, the one thing I would say I would argue against is the necess the implication that it's all J.B. Pritzker's fault because it's not, this is a comedy of errors across the board from Johnson to Pritzker to the Biden administration, mainly the Biden administration, of course, but this is a comedy of errors across the board. I think Pritzker's response to this is silly that he's going so hard against uh, Curran and the Republicans in his response. Perhaps he's just trying to get the heat off of himself because he knows the more heat he can put on Johnson for a migrant crisis and take it off himself, the better he looks. So I thought well, I were him, Pritzker's theme song is "It Ain't My Fault," so uh, he, there's always somebody for him to blame. And it really, and on this instance, like he's probably third on the list of the three I just mentioned in, in terms of whose fault it is for the migrant crisis in this state. I mean, Johnson is certainly way ahead of him, and Biden, of course, way in front of him. But still, I mean, it, it was a good play by the Senate Republicans. The migrant crisis isn't going to go away anytime soon, especially while. Brandon Johnson looks a gift horse in the mouth from the Archdiocese of Chicago and says, no, I will not take your free help. We're going to let people get, you know, measles at the Pilsen migrant shelter for the third time. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a good move by the Republicans. Still a smart move from Pritzker to try and get off his back, but I would have been, he should have played it better than just yelling at them. That's kind of stupid. I'm going to be a bad guy again. Oh, come on, Patrick. Don't do it. Don't. You, First of you, all, you, this is, this is pointless posturing from Senate Republicans, which they are pretty much all they do at this point is pointless posturing. The The governor's response was the typical uh, arrogant, bloviating bullshit that we see from these guys all the time. And I'm sick of politicians who are just getting in their corners and not worrying about the things that really matter. We can't fix the federal border crisis. We can't stop Congress from not acting and Joe Biden from not acting. The legislature, the governor, the mayor of Chicago, who is doing a terrible job at this. There is zero understanding of the human impact of these asylum seekers who are in the United States legally. Asylum is a legal process. Kathy could pull up the federal statute. There are five-year-olds without shoes who are coming here on a bus at no choice of their own. Until Congress gets its crap together, when are we going to realize that these are people who need help? It's a short-term crisis, but we're, we're seeing five-year-olds die in shelters in Pilsen. Have some heart, have some compassion. I am sick of Republicans who are treating human beings like they're dogs. Grow up. Is it is it in this your estimation so only I'm so only angry. Republicans who are playing politics in uh, in your I, estimation? I don't believe Republicans are the only ones playing politics. I absolutely believe Democrats have played politics. Well, and all I'm saying is yell at both sides then. You can't just pick one side of this I argument. Just you did. You yelled at only Republicans. I'm Talking to you in this case, because but, your side is the one that has been so horrible about your rhetoric about people who are here illegally. How much money, how much money has the governor given people who are definitely here illegally for health care? Do you have that number? And they're that's here a, illegally. And that's and by and the way, can, there's a lot can, of people. And you can have a you can hold have on, Patrick, an honest Patrick, conversation. Hold on, Patrick. About, about Patrick, hold on. Patrick, hold on. Let Mark go ahead and talk. There's a lot of people posing as migrants too. 
the way the Biden administration has allowed it, there's a ton of people posing, and the Biden administration and Democrats have created the situation that causes the five-year-old to come here and potentially die. Because what they do is they sit back on their high horse and say, oh yeah, sanctuary city, bring them all, bring them all, and then they can't handle it. It was really easy for decades for people to pass sanctuary city laws and stuff like that when it's not on their doorstep and it's down and it's and it's down in Texas. I'm very much pro-immigration, very much pro-immigration. But the way they have done it with the welcome mat and the sanctuary city status and all those sorts of things, that's not Greg Abbott's fault. That's the Democrats' fault for creating that environment. And we, when you do things like give free health care to illegals, you will get more illegals coming to Illinois. All that stresses the, stresses the system. The true migrants that actually have that, that, that are from Ukraine or political asylum, all that stuff, heck yeah, we should be helping them. And heck yeah, we should be having the, uh, the, the Catholic Church helping them. And heck yeah, there should be people like me and you and everybody else helping them. My family helped a group of migrants from from Vietnam for about five years when I was a kid, from age five to 10. We took them on vacations, we helped get them housing, we did a lot of stuff. The community came together. They made this a political issue and it's a dog caught car situation where now they have to deal with the mess they created because they did create this mess. And it's horrible what's happening to those people, but it's not the Republicans that created this mess. Not at but all. I, and I love how we're at here where it's like over, for years and years, Democrats have kept Republicans out from the governing table. They don't let us in the room to, when it comes to making decisions. They created this mess to the point that Mark is making. And now suddenly that it's here, they're like, oh, Republicans, why aren't you helping us fix this? Like, hold on a second. You don't let us in the room at all to govern. But now you want to blame us a little bit for this because you don't want the blame. And frankly, sorry, Patrick, but you're playing right along with it. I'll let you have the final word because I gave you a little crap, but then we'll move to the next topic. Well, for the 50,000th time, sanctuary city, sanctuary state has nothing to do with asylum seekers. Yeah, and, that's and, and I'm legally, tired, legally, that's true, but it's actually not common sense. That's not. I'm tired of the BS from both sides. And I wish we would, you know, if if the Trump side wouldn't have killed the border bill, if Democrats would be serious about border security, if Republicans would have some heart. I'm tired of the politics on this issue. These are human beings. Let's act Let's act like it. That's all I'm asking for. It's fair, fair point, fair position. All right, let's make this the last thing. We're on the migrant crisis, and I've already taken up a ton of your people's time, but we got to cover this because we're on the migrant crisis. So, um, <laughs> During the whole Bears thing, uh, when the Bears came out in the last week and said, yeah, we're focused on Chicago now, the state rep, the Democratic state rep in the Arlington Heights area, or one of them, Mark Walker, came out with a statement that was, I'm sure so many Democrats were like, why, you idiot? Why did you say that? So the statement was moreover, yeah, not a big deal. We figured they might do this, blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. But here's the end of it where he said, well, I'm looking forward to conversations about that Arlington Park site, about what we could do there. Maybe we could do new business development or more affordable housing or maybe even welcoming centers for new arrivals. <laughs> I think every Democrat who saw that wanted to take Mark Walker out and shoot him, basically, um, because he's basically saying, hey, let's bring the migrant crisis to Arlington Heights. And kudos to the Republicans of Wheeling Township. Kudos to the Cook County Republican Party for jumping on this immediately. More Republicans should have. And hopefully after watching this, they will, because in essence, the Democratic state rep in Arlington Heights basically said, hey, let's bring the migrant crisis to Arlington Heights into this region, into the former Arlington Park location. A stupid thing for him to say and a very big political liability that some Republicans have jumped on already. So I'll open it up for anybody else who might have some thoughts on this. But I can tell you as somebody who got married at the Arlington Park location, um, who is a little bit of my soul died. My dad was a jockey there. So a little bit of my soul died when they knocked that park down. Uh, if it becomes a, a welcoming center, I'll be one of the least favorite, least people in favor of that idea. I, I'm just going to give a little, a little. Uh, I don't know if it's a shout out to Mark Walker, but what, what Mark, Mark Walker is not afraid to say what he thinks and he does try to step out and solve problems in his way. So there's a lot of people that might've thought it and not said it for political reasons. So yeah, at least have to give him credit for verbalizing his thoughts right. to the people of his district. I don't know if anybody's running against him, um, but I can tell you that I had a lot of a lot of long conversations with Mark Walker. I didn't always agree with him, but he was one of those people that I never thought was BSing me. And this is proof that he isn't, um, right. that he isn't trying, to, trying to BS anybody because he's it's obviously, politically not the most astute thing to do. 
Um, that that's my only thought on it, and that's what I think happened there. It was just Mark Walker being, yeah, being, being Mark being Mark Walker being the the purest that he is, being one of those people that Patrick uh, talks about wanting to solve problems and and deal with the issue that Patrick's passionate about. And and that's that's exactly how I read it. Was I, I'm, Walker is known as a a guy who wants to be a problem solver, whether you like him or not, uh, whether you agree with him or not. I read this as as him trying to present options and solutions, not yeah. not anything political or not. And I I didn't I didn't think very much of it either way when I read the quote. Honestly. Yeah, listen, you you you, got, you guys you guys are probably right. I don't know no Walker. I will uh, um, respect your take on it, but let's move past that his intentions and look at we do this with Republicans, right? Good intentions, stupid politics. We can all agree it was a very very dumb thing to say. Well, certainly it was a dumb thing to say politically, but honest to God, it might have been the smartest solution in the migrant crisis I've heard yet from somebody down in Springfield. I mean, seriously, Arlington Park, that's a lot of territory. You want to have a welcoming shelter? I mean, no, all these areas in the city of Chicago didn't work. We're not taking the Cardinals free help. So if we're going to do something that's going to cost taxpayer money, Arlington Pike Park might be the location. I'm sorry, Colin, but if we're talking practically here, that's that it might, it might work. Listen, here, the only good news about that is if they do start seriously talking about that, that will really help Republicans win a lot of elections in this region because there's not going to be a lot of suburban women no, who are going to support Colin. that. No, it won't. And, oh, yeah, no, it will. And, Colin. And no suburban and, woman in this area will be happy with a migrant welcoming center in Arlington care. Park. They care about abortion in that area more than they care about the migrant crisis, Colin. You're not going to win back the 54th state representative district in Arlington Heights just because Mark Walker or whatever the heck this guy's name is decided to make it a migrant shelter. The Republicans yeah. are still going to lose that well, district by 12 points. And we're all going to lose I'm, by 14 I'm, this time. I'm worried about 51 uh winning that seat taking that seat back I'm, I'm talking a little bit further out yeah we're not winning Arlington Heights but we got some key races keeping McLaughlin in um getting uh, uh Nabila Saeed out and getting Tossie for DK there like we've got some key races up here that if they want to make the migrant crisis an issue in the northwest suburbs we will happily allow that to happen maybe it helps us in the Lake County State's Attorney's race since Eric Reinhardt is such a far left progressive it might help us there I welcome this if they want to bring the migrant crisis out to the northwest suburbs as a political issue it helps Republicans and then Can we personal throw some pack flowers? drops a half a million on mail, and then you're, it does, it's all me. Can we throw some flowers in Chris's direction for talking about the uh, the the archdiocese uh, having offered uh, space for for literally months uh, before the media actually picked it up? So uh, kudos to him on that one. Yeah, we don't say nice things about Chris. <laughs> no one's saying nice things about me lately either. So here I am. <laughs> There you go. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> I greatly appreciate it. Uh, all right. Let's get some closing thoughts and let everybody get on with their days here. Uh, we got through most of our agenda. Thank you, guys. That was an awesome discussion. Uh, in this section, everyone just gets to give whatever their final thoughts might be on any political topic. Kathy, we've all been screaming at each other. Uh, bring some sanity back. What are your final thoughts for everybody? I think Illinois and the country is one big hurt. And uh, this... Uh, We've got two nominees on the ballot for the presidency, and I think everyone needs to look hard at their life and say, was my life better three, four years ago under the policies of the former administration? And I think that's why there's going to be a Republican sweep at the top, and I will hope that it'll redound in victory down ballot. How bad does it have to get in Illinois before we we, we change course of our, our state? My position is there is that uh, Democrats win election because they get people hooked on um, state assistance, and that's their main constituency, while Republicans and small business uh, uh, carries the tab. Hmm. And so I think we need to build a vibrant uh um, support the, the the nuclear element of society, which is the the family and small business, and then we'll have stronger communities and safety and security in our communities are, is key to that. Oh, last but not least, as to sanctuary cities, I think that when people proclaim they're a sanctuary city, uh, they got to now they look at the long term consequences of that, and I don't think it's right that those non sanctuary uh, communities should be. Um, uh, you know, should have to pay the price of of, of, of JB and other people's um, uh, decisions. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Kathy. Appreciate you being here. It's been awesome having you. Who else wants to jump in with their final thoughts? Republicans should be careful with the uh, are you better off than you were four years ago uh, statement right now, because four years ago you couldn't buy toilet paper uh, during the Trump administration. 
Uh, I will say turnout, I, I would think, is probably going to be uh, incredibly low uh, next week. Uh, I don't know that it will be 2020 low, at least on the Republican side, but probably pretty bad. Uh, and and uh, I, I would guess that uh, 2012 bad uh, for Democrats in, in terms of, of uh, turnout as well. And that that um, that really hampering uh, the turnout, you know, helps your institutionals, uh, too. That helps your incumbents in the, the House and Senate. That helps your incumbents in Congress. Uh, the, the only difference might be the Boss Bailey race, just because of what we saw with the Haley voters. Uh, but but I'm expecting turnout to be incredibly low next week. Yeah, you're probably not wrong on that. Mark, final thoughts from you, my friend. I got I got a lot of stuff that's after the primary, uh, but I'll go with this one thought. I hope after after the immediately after the primary, the Republican House caucus can heal up a little bit and maybe uh, have some good fights because they're pretty they, they appear to be pretty disjointed right now. And it would, I would there might be some opportunities in in a handful of races, and it would be nice to see us pick up some seats from the low number we're at right now. Well, I know we all miss you down there. Um, you were a, a voice of sanity down there, so we miss having you there. But we'll absolutely love to have you back here. We got to talk pensions. We got to talk a lot of other things that I know you're an expert on. So we look forward to having you on again in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, that pensions one will get as many viewers as the state's attorney debate did in uh, <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> we can only dream. <laughs> uh, Chris, Michael, what do you guys got? Chris, you can go first. For all the people making your novenas for the victory of Eileen O'Neill Burke for state's attorney, keep it up. Maybe throw in a rosary or two um, because we're pushing hard. We need to save Cook County. I don't care about the Republicans' chances in November. They're never going to win in Cook County. All I care about is having safe streets in, Will in Cook County. So hopefully Burke's campaign stupidity doesn't screw her over, but we'll find out on Tuesday. So tune in next week where you see me lose my mind. <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna say that we uh, survived one of the craziest primary cycles that I've ever seen, but we still do have five days left. So stay strong, everybody. We're almost there, and hopefully, we have a a good Tuesday and the good guys win. Cool. Uh, I appreciate everybody being on. On my end, I'll just say I don't know what the next couple of weeks are weeks are gonna look like. I'm here in our uh, nursery for our new baby boy who's coming in a week. Uh, and we don't know how that's going to look. So you might have guest hosts in the next couple of weeks for these episodes to our viewers. Uh, we might have some special features. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So if I'm not on the next couple of weeks, I'll miss y'all. But uh, I got my first boy on the way and we've been waiting for almost eight years for our first kids. So that's going to be my focus. We're very excited. Uh, so for our viewers, thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for watching. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks to our producer, Lane Davis. Primaries next Tuesday. If you haven't voted, please, dear God, get out and vote. Bring five people with you. And then we'll talk about the results on next week's SFR. Thanks, everybody.